They were the hottest teen actors in Hollywood. There was an immediate chemistry between the two. Everywhere we went, screaming fans. In the late 80s, Corey Haim and Corey Feldman shared a fast rise and a terrible fall. Everything becomes too fun, everything becomes too accessible. Drugs, booze. It's just spun out of control. They're not prepared for the impact that they're having, for the celebrity that they become. Few saw so much so soon. But through 20 years of controversy, they would remain friends and partners. Corey and I are like a real family. We really are like brothers in every sense of the word. We've been through it all together. Nothing to lose. Leads you to where you are today. I believe in storytelling. It's gonna make you a star. I'm still trying to figure that out. In the late 80s, they were the biggest teen idols on the map. So big, in fact, that like Prince and Madonna, they were known by one name, the Corys. Everything is the Corys, the Corys, the Corys. I mean, like with the Beatles, it was just, it was too much. I mean, it was absolutely crazy. It's great. It was fantastic. They had all this money, they had all this fame, people throwing themselves at them at a really, really early age, and they were a phenomenon. They were a pop culture phenomenon. Beginning with the cult hit The Lost Boys, released in 1987, Corey Feldman and Corey Haim co-starred in seven different films and graced the bedroom walls of legions of female fans. Then, after a break of nearly a decade, they reunited on screen in the summer of 2007, partnering in the TV reality series, The Two Corys. It was a chance to showcase their unique bond once again. It was like jumping right back in the saddle. Just, we know a little more and we're a little grayer and a little chunkier. You have these sort of two opposing forces that, um, that come together after not having seen each other for a period of time and are reconnecting. Cora, I'm single. I haven't had a girlfriend in a long time. I turned 35 and you just told me I'm doing Lost Boys too, man. It's a pretty f***ing bad day so far. But you're alive. I understand that. Both of us made our mistakes, okay, but we grew up. And now we got to make it right. Him. The Corys will always have a connection, but in the two decades since they stole teenage hearts, a lot has changed as well. I'm a vegetarian, into the environment, I'm about ecology. Corey, I mean, could not be more the extreme opposite. I got older and better looking, and he just got older and ugly. Through it all, Corey Haim and Corey Feldman have never stopped working, toiling on everything from off-Broadway plays to Hollywood blockbusters. If you take away all the kind of tabloid fodder that's followed them, you know, through their career, and you look at the body of work that they've done, I mean, there's some, some serious stuff there. But although both are clean and sober today, they will always be equally famous for their problems with partying. By the tender age of 22, dazzled by their early success, they had endured drug problems. I know that I have a problem. Arrests, even in Corey Feldman's case, a divorce. I was a young kid who had money and was let out of a cage. So of course I went crazy. If you're gonna go that hard, you're gonna crash and burn. My life has always been a roller coaster. I've gone to some amazingly high peaks and to some amazingly low lulls. Corey Feldman was the second of five children, born on July 16, 1971. He was raised in Reseda, California, just up the freeway from Hollywood. And from the beginning, his father Bob seemed determined that his son have a career in pictures. The dad wanted to be a manager, wanted to be a, uh, a Hollywood player, and so 
the motivation behind it was definitely from the very beginning. Uh, he's going to be in films. For me, my destiny was laid out in front of me. I was famous before I even know my own name. This was Corey Feldman's on-screen debut, a McDonald's commercial with a holiday theme, filmed when Corey was just three. <laughs> From then on, his life was one long series of auditions and acting roles, something that took a toll on his childhood. I was working enough to never be able to uh, consistently go to school, never be able to join like baseball teams or softball, little league, that kind of stuff. So I could never really be part of a team, you know, and that, that was hard. He didn't get to go to regular schools like other kids did. And when he went, kids are cruel and they can, they make fun of somebody that they're jealous of. And that was a, that was a major part of his, his childhood. By the age of nine, Corey was a major breadwinner for the Feldman family, with roles in films such as Time After Time and TV series like The Bad News Bears. But although his career as an actor seemed promising, his life at home was growing less and less so. I had just done a series, Bad News Bears, and then my parents broke up right after that. I think at that point, uh, my mom really kind of went off the deep end because she was on her own. Corey viewed going to a movie set as an escape from his parents. And as soon as he walked off the set, there was mom, and his spirits would drop. By 1985, acting was a refuge for Corey. He was becoming well known as a child star with roles in box office blockbusters like Gremlins and The Goonies. Then, Corey scored his breakthrough role as the troubled Teddy Duchamp in the film Stand By Me. Some who knew him believed his inner turmoil made his on-screen performance all too believable. His role in Stand By Me as Teddy Duchamp was almost tragic. Maybe he, he, <laughs> he drew some something from his real life experiences. That was one of the most amazing movies I've ever seen. And I think that showed that what he could do. You call my dad loony again and I'll kill you. Looney, looney, looney. Ah! I'm gonna rip your head off and shit down your neck! Oh, no! Corey Feldman's star was rising. And he was about to meet someone who would help propel him to the top. Corey Haim was born on December 23, 1971, and raised in Toronto, Canada. And even as a toddler, he seemed to have a knack for getting the attention of an audience. He was adorable. Everybody took to him so, so fondly. It was always very entertaining. When Corey was nine, his older sister Carol brought him along to an audition. In a matter of months, Corey signed on with Carol's agent and soon, he was appearing in commercials. By the age of 11, he'd scored a starring role in the family-oriented series the Edison Twins. It just snowballed. It just went from the Edison Twins to getting busy. To getting really busy. And we had no time to think. After minor roles in several motion pictures, Haim got his big break in 1986 with Lucas. His heartwarming performance as an underdog trying to win a girl's heart had critics raving and audiences cheering. I loved Lucas. That was one of my favorite movies in the 80s. To me, he's that little guy with the glasses. He just was on top of the world. Um, parts kept coming his way, and once that movie was made, it was so popular, and everyone really loved the movie that I think he really realized, you know, what was going to happen in, in his life. He felt the best in front of the camera. I don't know, I guess he was born with that. It's either you have it or you don't. You know, it's that simple. And you seem to have had it. Each of the Corys was becoming a famous actor in his own right. But they would soon meet and form an even more formidable team.
In 1986, after starring in the hit film Lucas, 14-year-old Corey Haim was ready to make acting his life's work. So he and his parents decided to leave their native Canada to concentrate full-time on Hollywood. We decided to move to Los Angeles because we were we found ourselves really and truly on the plane, like constantly. Haim's next big role was in the movie that would bring him together with Corey Feldman. The film was a teenage vampire flick called The Lost Boys, directed by Joel Schumacher. It took two tries for Corey Feldman to make the cut. Initially, I wasn't really the right guy for the role because I had this kind of clean cut, nice boy image and, you know, they needed somebody pretty cold and hard for the part of Edgar Frog. So he said, well, you need to toughen up your voice. You need to go watch a bunch of Rambo movies. So I went back like six months later, I'd grown my hair out, got the voice together, got the character together and I went back in and read for him. He said, yep, that's it. In the summer of 1986, filming began on The Lost Boys. New to town and eager to make friends, Corey Haim reached out to co-star Corey Feldman. I get this phone message on my answering machine. Uh, hey dude, this is Corey Haim. <laughs> He's like, you know, hey man, we're gonna be doing this movie together. So like, let's, let's hang out, dude. It'd be really cool, man. Let's hang out. Let's get to know each other. We just moved there. So we didn't really know anyone. So Corey Feldman and my Corey became friends instantly. They were the same age. And they've had such a bond, an immediate bond, when they first met. We pump each other up sometimes and we're partners, but I think when we met on The Lost Boys, we have a chemistry with each other on screen. Um, I feel it. He feels it. I don't know what it is. Maybe because we're both nuts. While the two hit it off immediately, Corey Feldman was drifting further and further away from his family. Disagreements over the way his earnings were distributed led Corey to become more estranged from his parents. When he was 15, he decided that enough was enough with his dad and that he was not going to let him be his manager anymore. And that's the point when I decided to get emancipated. So I have to now make a mature decision to do this on my own. At the age of 15, Corey Feldman took his mother and father to court, sued for legal emancipation, and won. He was free from his parents, but about to confront an entirely new set of problems. I walked out of the courtroom at 15 years old with nothing but the opportunity to make my life as I chose. No kid should be legally emancipated when they're 15 or 16 or 70. You don't make the right decisions. The emancipation itself, in theory, was a really good idea. However, as with all positive things in life, there's always a pitfall, there's always a downside. I had no idea how to be responsible for myself, but I've already got a group of vultures surrounding me, and 15-year-olds are not the best decision makers. <laughs> Corey Haim was dealing with family issues of his own. Shortly after moving to Los Angeles, his parents decided to split up, and both Corey's father and older sister Carol headed back to Canada. Corey thinks that it was his fault. He really thought it was because he started becoming an actor, because we moved, because we disrupted the whole family. Corey's parents divorcing was very difficult for him. It really separated the family. I was like, ooh, it just felt weird that my parents' marriage is dissolved. Like, it never happened. Both Corys were bitterly disappointed with their family lives. But when their movie, The Lost Boys, premiered in July of 1987, they vaulted into the top ranks of teen movie stars. When a vampire buys it, it's never a pretty sight. No two bloodsuckers go out the same way. Some yell and scream, some go quietly. Some explode, some implode. There was an immediate chemistry between the two, and you can see it on the screen. Their sparks flew. They played off each other. It was just the most amazing pairing of young actors that I've seen in a long, long time. I think they really realized that they had something special together and they tried to take it to their advantage. They were like real best friends. They were like your friends 
cool brother and his friend. And then from that point on, for the next, I don't know, five years, we were pretty much inseparable. I mean, we hung out every day after work. We were together constantly. There was no kind of, you know, master plan or big brain idea to put us together. It really just happened haphazardly. The Lost Boys sparked what became known as Corey Mania and changed the lives of the two teen actors forever. Corey Mania was to us pretty much the same as what Beatlemania must have been to them, except on obviously a smaller scale. I mean, we were literally in the eye of a tornado. Every young girl had their pictures on their locker and had a type, and you either had one Corey or the other that you're interested in. Everywhere we went, screaming fans. I mean, everywhere. In the late 1980s, Corey Haim and Corey Feldman were the highest paid teen actors in Hollywood, beloved both by studio chiefs and young girls from coast to coast. They were so big, they were so big, in all honesty, they were so big, so well known. It was craziness. And everywhere we went, all over the United States, anytime we showed up together, I mean, even if we showed up individually, but especially if we were together, it was just this, this apex of, of pandemonium and insanity. The girls reacted to both of them like rock stars. They screamed. I think they, they both really loved it. I actually remember one time I was out in Los Angeles and we were in a mall together and we actually made a mad dash for, for, the, for the parking lot because we were being chased down by a, a bunch of girls. People want me to like actually give an autograph while I'm driving, doing like 60 on the freeway. It's, you know, um, nuts, 16 years old. I just got my fourth car in four months, going through them like nuts. It was a crazy, crazy, crazy lifestyle. By the time the duo began working on License to Drive in the fall of 1987, the mania was at an all-time high. We were trying to shoot License to Drive at this high school here in Los Angeles, and we couldn't shoot anything because it was just tremendous roaring of these kids all the time. And they would shake our trailers, like rocking our trailers, and we're stuck inside the trailer getting tossed around going, oh my God, what are we going to do? And I'd just like, we'd open the door for a second, I'd throw some autographs out, close the door. Somehow, the Corys managed to complete the movie. And when it was released in July of 1988, License to Drive was a major hit with the Tiger Beat set. You know, Dean, I can't help wondering. It's never gonna get that good for me. Anderson, the only difference between you and that greaseball is that he has a license and you don't. From an artistic standpoint, okay, License to Drive wasn't the greatest movie ever. But I wouldn't say it was a bad teen flick. I think it was actually pretty highbrow, considering it was a teenage comedy. Eager to cash in on their newfound fame, the Corys collaborated on another movie, Dream a Little Dream. But by the time the movie hit theaters a year later, Corey Mania had already begun to wane. Dream a Little Dream was probably the biggest bomb, but the highest concept, but had a huge afterlife in cable and video and everything else. The movie got mixed reviews and so-so box office receipts. Worse, both Corys were beginning to resent the fact that many people couldn't seem to tell them apart. We couldn't take it anymore. We were losing our identities. I'd walk down the street, people would be like, Corey Haynes, Feldhaim or Haimfeld. So it was like, look, if I'm gonna continue having a career, I need to step out on my own. Hey, Corey. By 1989, the Corys not only had their names and ages in common, they had drug problems in common as well. Flush with money and troubled by his career path, Corey Feldman began experimenting with drugs well before his 18th birthday. It was a very quick and steady progression. I was, ironically enough, doing work for the Nancy Reagan Just Say No Foundation. After the three films were over was when I started getting into my really bad drug problem and he got into his, just kind of the beginning stages of his. Corey started acting a little funny, you know, and I didn't really exactly know what it was. And then somebody came and told me that he was using cocaine. 
After Lost Boys, things got a little difficult for him. I think there was a point in his career where just with the pressure and I think also probably a lot of it relates back to his family splitting up. At a time when most kids are preparing for final exams, Corey Haim was hitting Hollywood clubs and acquiring a major drug habit. It's a pattern I slipped into. Everything becomes too fun, everything becomes too accessible. Drugs, booze. I mean, I got my Lost Boys tattoo, it's 15 and a half. When you're a 16-year-old actor and you're living in Hollywood and you've got all the money in the world and all of the freedoms that you want, I don't think you're in the right state of mind to make the correct decisions. The irony of my whole life story is that out of everybody in Hollywood, I've probably done less drugs and less alcohol and less partying than 90% of the community because I did it for two years. That was the whole run was two years. It was like started smoking weed like 14 years old and by 15 I tried cocaine, acid, mushrooms, everything except for heroin by I think it was 16, I started heroin. It just spun out of control like most child actors. They're not prepared for the impact that they're having, for the celebrity that they become, and it probably led to their, their drug addiction and all the trouble they got into. By 1990, the Corey's fast rise had been matched by an equally ferocious fall. These prototypically cute teens were suddenly seen as bad boys, and Hollywood cast-offs. On the cover of all these teenage magazines, that turns your head around. It makes you think that life is going to go on like this forever, but it doesn't. You're used to the paparazzis being there. You get used to people coming and wanting autographs. You know, it's just a way of life because you become like a face, you know, where everybody recognizes you. And if you don't get that, you go, oh, okay, what's wrong with me? It was like, you know, one minute you're on top, the next minute we don't even want to talk to you. We don't want to talk about you. I mean, you're an embarrassment. Once the brightest of on-screen partners, Corey Haim and Corey Feldman now shared a very different and very stark reality. Struggling to find their way. Both had bad drug habits and stalling careers. Disillusioned, Corey Feldman was looking for something better in life. And in the summer of 1989, he thought he found it when he met actress Vanessa Marcel. When Corey was 18, he met Vanessa. They got married two months later. My first marriage was a very dysfunctional relationship. And we were very codependent and yet very destructive at the same time. The marriage certainly didn't change Corey's worsening habits. On March 9, 1990, he was stopped by police and arrested for having 25 balloons of heroin in his car. The cop pulled him over, digs into the back seat, and there are balloons of heroin. Off to jail. Oh, it was awful. The media in general um, kind of made me the staple punching bag for the era. I know that I have a problem and I would like to take care of that problem. I would like to see, seek help for myself and I would also like to help others. So the sooner I can help myself, I can help other people. I mean, literally, I had comedians making jokes about me. I had uh, newspapers saying some of the most awful, just mean-spirited, degrading things I've ever read about anybody. It went from like, oh, he's a drug addict, he's got a problem, to what a loser, to what a has-been, to oh my god, he's washed up, and why are we even talking about him and wasting the news ink? But the humiliation wasn't enough to force Corey to get sober. Six months after his first arrest, he was busted again for heroin possession. Even by the standards of Hollywood, it was a stunningly fast fall. There had never been a teen actor that was as successful as I was that had fallen as hard as I did. It hadn't happened. I was hurting myself, he was hurting himself. We went through a dark period. I had so much and I lost it and I destroyed it and I have nobody to blame now except for myself. 
Feldman accepted a plea bargain and was ordered to Cry Help, a drug treatment center for nine months of rehab. He successfully completed the program, but soon found that staying sober wasn't the only challenge he faced. The great misconception is that, oh, he was a child star, he made millions of dollars. But after 13 until 18, I had drug problems, I had legal problems, I had all this stuff that soaks up your money. So at 18 years old, there I was once again reinventing the wheel. And at that point, after all of my struggles and my battles and coming out clean and sober, I was $100,000 in the hole. I got a divorce from my wife. That ended terribly. Feldman stayed clean. But as he auditioned for new roles in Hollywood, he found that his past was difficult to escape. After Corey got sober, uh, the roles really started to dry up because casting directors thought, is he going to show up? And I did Meatballs 4, these like terrible, schlocky movies, which I later realized catapulted me into B-movie stardom, which was the worst thing in the world to me. Just at the time that I could value art and appreciate the right choices in a career, it was too late for me to do anything about it. By the early 90s, both Corey's careers were flatlining. Worse, Corey Haim continued to do drugs. All the stuff I've ingested in my body, all the crazy nights I've had with my friends driving me to the hospital if I'm overdosing, am I overdosing? So being famous and doing the drugs was my pattern for right then. Corey and I went down the road together train left the station and when we got to the B platform I jumped off he kept going during the period that that Corey was clean Corey Haim had not yet kicked his habits and Corey Feldman was probably suffering from the which Corey was that now because Haim had still not cleaned his act up in the mid-1990s, the Corys teamed up again on three more films. Blown Away, National Lampoon's Last Resort, and the sequel to Dream a Little Dream. But they were unable to recapture their 80s magic. We had signed a three-picture deal with National Lampoon. We only did one of those three pictures. National Lampoon's Last Resort, which was the worst movie we ever did together. Just a train wreck. But for all of these films, I was already sober, and Corey had a big secret because he wasn't telling me where he was at and I wasn't asking. At the end of Dream Little Dream 2, there was a lot of inconsistencies. He wouldn't come out of his trailer. He was nodding in and out on the set sometimes. So I knew there was something going on. I just didn't know what. And then the last film we tried to do together was a film that I directed. <laughs> In 1995, Fellman hired Haim to star in his directorial debut, Busted. It seemed like a chance for the longtime friends to take their creative partnership to a new level. I knew that would be an interesting dynamic, trying to suddenly direct the guy that I'd been partners with. But what I didn't realize was how out of control his drug problem had already become. By that film, he was already to the point where he could not make it through a workday. So he was on the set, I believe, one or two days, and I had to fire him, which was one of the hardest decisions I ever had to make in my career. That's one thing about that disease, the drug disease, the drink disease. You become an addict, you become very, very frickin' selfish. You completely don't care or worry about what anyone else is feeling. You can't. You're too high. At least I was. Busted was exactly that, busted. In the aftermath, Corey Haim tried to get clean. Instead, he simply added to his vices. When a doctor prescribed Valium to help him deal with the effects of quitting cocaine, Haim became addicted to the pills. We gave him 100 Valium to begin with, instead of one or two or monitoring the pill. So he got hooked on uh, pills. He can't really step out when it's happening and go, well, this is what's happening in my life and I don't care about anybody or anything else but me. It got worse and worse and worse to the point where he was showing up and doing interviews on television incoherent. Feldman happens to think I've taken more drugs than Keith Richards. 
God forbid, I mean, I don't know how bad my body is. After several failed attempts to kick drugs, Corey Hames' future seemed bleak. When he got an unexpected call from his old friend. Corey Feldman videotaped me for four days, once. He did uh, a life documentary on his best friend, brother, Mr. Hain, about what I'm like on medication and what I'm like when I'm just awake, like awakened in the morning, off everything. And he finally caught me on like the fifth morning. Corey played me those tapes. I was crying for four days. Watching that hugging Susie going, oh my God, burn him, burn him. It was an eye opener, dude. So that was the last time I touched that drug. In 1997, Corey Haim wanted nothing more than to get off drugs and get his career back on track. The first step toward doing that was moving back to Canada, leaving Hollywood and its temptations behind. There was a definite incident that I went, I've had enough. And I thought, one too many rehabs, plus being told by people who care about me, like you know, my mom, my dad, um, Jason, you know, um, kid. Maybe it's time for you to come home, man. Just come home. It's a different environment in Canada and Toronto. It gave him a chance to get away from, from Hollywood and just be a normal human being without being harassed. As Haim returned home, Corey Feldman found himself hitting hard times yet again. His money was dwindling, and he was starring in straight-to-video movies. Here I was once again broke, once again destitute, sober still, but now the press hated me even more, the media hated me even more, and the fans completely disheartened. Feldman had one creative outlet left that still satisfied him, his band, Corey Feldman's Truth Movement. I had so much and I lost it. And so with all that, I wrote a very dark and dingy and self-deprecating autobiographical album. And that was my Truth Movement album, which is called Still Searching for Soul. Just the title alone should tell you everything you need to know. But Corey Feldman's life was about to take a turn for the better. In 2001, after a string of bad relationships, he met 19-year-old model Susie Sprague at an L.A. club. With Susie, I broke my two cardinal rules of dating, which is one, never take a relationship seriously if you meet him at a nightclub, and two, never date a fan. So she stopped me and she said, hi, you're Corey Feldman, right? I said, yes. She said, I, I, I'm your biggest fan. I, I've been your fan all the way up until... And I said, well, until when? And she said, today. And I was like, good answer. All right, let's go have a dance. I was a huge fan. And that's kind of an understatement. It was pretty early on. I realized, like, wow, this guy is way more than I ever thought he would be. He's not your typical human being. He's not your typical guy. And um, it was really, really what I needed at that point in my life. I dated plenty of beautiful girls by that point. It was the inner beauty that she possessed that I hadn't seen ever in my life. By Valentine's Day 2002, Feldman was ready to pop the question. And when he and Susie were married nine months later, it was in front of the entire nation on the reality series, The Surreal Life. The ceremony was officiated by MC Hammer. May God bless your marriage. <laughs> the producer said, you know, oh, it's gonna be great television. We'll pay $100,000 for your wedding. So I called Susie. She said, well, I'm game. You know, sure, it's gonna save us $100,000. And I were, were plenty of family members who were opposed to the idea of it being on TV. I don't recommend people get married on television, but for us, it was, it was fun. It definitely was fun. Many who saw the show thought the marriage was a stunt, but in fact, the relationship was rock solid. 
Two years later, in August of 2004, Susie gave birth to their first child, a son named Zen. As with many people, marriage is the best thing that ever happened, and it's the best thing that ever happened to Corey. And then with the, the birth of their son, Zen, that's his family is really a major focus of his life now. It's no longer the same vibe going over there. Now I go over there and the baby's sleeping. He's an impressive father. He loves our son very much, and it's very sweet. And we have a very nice little unit. You know, the three of us are really all we need. Being a father is the greatest thing on earth. Not only am I giving him an opportunity for a beautiful life, but I'm also making up for the damage that was done to me. So it's a two-fold win-win situation. You know, I get to help encourage him to have a great, long, healthy life, and I also get to fix some of the holes in my own life. As Corey Feldman enjoyed domestic life, his old friend Corey Haim quietly kicked drugs once and for all. By the end of 2005, nearly 20 years after they hit Hollywood together, both Corys were finally clean. It took a while to get back to myself and, you know, I'm not going to say that I had bad times. I had some bad times and then got my head on right and here we are. I certainly went down the wrong road for a long time. If I hadn't f***ed up as many times as I did, then I wouldn't have gotten the lesson. I don't see mistakes as a bad thing. I see them as a challenge and an opportunity for growth. And that's why I'm the happy person I am today. By the end of 2005, both Corey Haim and Corey Feldman were sober, happy, and perhaps most amazingly after all they'd been through, still good friends. Corey and I are like a real family. We really are like brothers in every sense of the word. We've been through it all together. We've had extreme highs, we've had extreme lows, we've battled drug addictions, we've battled alcoholism, we've had spiritual, mind-blowing experiences together, we've had moments of depravity together. The fact that they're still best friends after 20 years says a lot. Most Hollywood relationships don't last past the three months it takes to film the movie. When they see each other, they pick it up where they left off. I guess they're probably going to be like that forever. <laughs> it's like my second kid. At the age of 35, the Corys had been through more turmoil than most will experience in a lifetime. But both continued to work as actors, and Corey Feldman added the cause of animal rights to his long list of interests. It's the best organization in the world for taking care of animals, which is my greatest love in the world. I think that Corey Feldman has come such a long way. He is a vegetarian, he's an environmentalist, he's very passionate about, um, you know, the way he lives his life and trying to be an ethical person. You know, he has a child, he is a great father, he's a responsible guy, he has a great wife and a great marriage. By 2006, it had been years since the Corys had appeared together on screen. Then that fall, A&E announced that the pair would be reunited in a new reality series entitled, appropriately enough, The Two Corys. It is my ultimate pleasure and honor to introduce my oldest partner, my best friend, my brother, Corey Feldman and the Truth Movement. There's been a lot of different titles for what this brand of entertainment is. Real life programming, improvised comedy. You know, I've been engaged twice. Once to Nicole Eggert. I didn't okay? even know. Once to Crick, okay? Once to Taryn, you know this. Taryn, who's Taryn? I think the excitement is actually that moment of seeing the two of us reconnecting. I mean, it's been 10 years since we've actually done anything together on screen. I was born to act. I love it too much on set. You know, so to work with Corey, and to get back in the saddle it was just like throwing a bonus my way. In the show, art imitates life. As Corey Haim checks in on childhood friend Corey Feldman and finds that he has found happiness as a husband and father. It's a guy who's got a wife and a guy who's still trying to figure out where his place is. So what becomes of it is 
it's something everybody can relate to. I think with two guys who kind of grew up as famous kind of buddies, there's always this element of competitiveness. So I think Corey Haim's definitely looking okay. to settle yes. down and to yes. find yes. his yes. Susie, yes. his Mrs. Yes. Haim. You're the problem of my love life. We're ourselves. What you see is genuine. Every emotion that you see, the palette that we go through, is genuine. That's the appeal. It's being the fly on the wall for the conversations you never thought you'd get to hear. Now, who introduced me to Nicole? Who introduced you to Christy Swanson? Who introduced me to Holly? I didn't introduce you to Holly. What are you, what are you oh, talking about? Oh, yeah, I did introduce you to Holly. So, right. what's your point? Each one of these girls, man, on my profile Unbelievably alone. hot. To anyone on the set, it was obvious that the spark between the two Corys remained as strong as ever. They're like 12 year olds together. I only say teenage boy because they kind of just digress to that when they're together. They become, you know, young guys again. And so out of that comes all these sort of silly situations and dynamics that they get themselves into. And I think there's something really fun about that, that people are just going to fall in love with them. Exactly 20 years after they burst on screen as a duo in The Lost Boys, the Corys were together again, hoping to appeal to both old fans and new. The boys have a huge fan base still. There's this definite built-in curiosity about, about where they are. At this point in my life, I've established my own identity to the point where I feel comfortable hanging out with a guy that happens to have the same name as me. I feel lucky I'm having a second chance. I couldn't wish or ask for a better partner. And Corey. Now we got to make it right. The show embodied the Corey's new lease on life. And despite everything each has been through, neither has any regrets about the past. I believe that I had a very awful, tumultuous childhood for a reason. I believe that I became the scapegoat or, you know, the world's buffoon for a reason. And I'm now trying not only to instill those values into my own son, but to also continue opening eyes and broadening minds in all kinds of aspects. I've tried to come up with every logical explanation as to why I'm not dead. Woo! I'm still here, I'm not even gonna question it. There's gotta be a reason I'm here still. Corey Haim is now healthy, happy, and sober. Taking the days as they come, and glad to have the love of family and friends. I just take things slower and have a different way of going to bed now and waking up. This is a much stronger, healthier, determined Corey that, than the Corey that I knew 15 years ago. He's got a much more focused, determined attitude and lifestyle. He's been clean for a while. He's doing very well. I can't complain, my son is alive. With his health intact and his spirit recovered, Corey is ready for a return to Hollywood, confident that he has overcome the demons of his past. I think actually enough time's gone by that I would be okay to live there. I have good people who like watch my so to speak. To be able to see him, you know, behind a camera, professional, working hard, making people laugh, those are the things that, that Corey's meant to do. Once we get a taste of the unique Corey Haim that's been marinating for years, I think that uh, the world's in for a big surprise. I've had so many chances, and I was out, and I got another chance. I'm not screwing this one up. Whatever happens in the future, the two Corys will be linked forever, and both hope that their best work is yet to come. I see another chapter for Corey and myself. I don't think we've even begun to tap the Richter at all yet. No matter how hard I try, he's never going to go away. And no matter how hard he tries, I'm never going to go away. We're joined together for life. Without one of us, the other cannot coexist. This is not the final chapter. It may be just the beginning. We're back!